I didn't feel fear about dying. I just knew that if I was going to die, I was going to die in battle. I remember talking to my college, our uh, dorm advisor, and he had been in the military. And I remember asking him, telling him that I was thinking of going into the military and what he thought about it. And his advice really stuck with me. He said, well, Gary, I'll tell you, the military will either kill you or make you a better person. And so I, I kind of took that challenge. Uh, I said, well, I think I'll try to become a better person by going into the military. So I. I chose to go in, um, wanted to go in Special Forces, but you couldn't list, enlist in Special Forces. It was a, uh, a volunteer organization. You had to go through all these qualification tests and things. So I, uh, but I raised my hand and made my first commitment for four years. And I remember after I made that commitment, I said, well, the next four years are certainly all cast in stone right now. I know what I'm going to be doing. Um, and it was the beginning of a, uh, a real challenging journey. And about five, six o'clock in the morning, we started taking incoming uh, explosions, artillery, rockets, mortars, um, pretty much leveled everything that was above ground within an hour. And uh, most, of the <coughs> most of the Americans were injured right away. I remember the first time I got, first time I got wounded, um, there was a, uh, an explosion and it was a rocket and I felt like I got kicked by a horse and I had this experience of seeing myself out of the body and seeing my body just kind of going head over heels and I slammed into the sandbag. There was a 4.2 inch mortar pit right outside the dispensary and I hit the sandbags. And then all of a sudden I was back into the body and I, um, and I tried to get up to move and I, I couldn't move, I couldn't move my, uh, cause shrapnel had slammed into my spine and it was kind of like knocked out my spinal cord. Um, but after landing there, the next thing I knew is I felt somebody picking me up and the person that picked me up was my 15 year old bodyguard that I had developed a relationship with. Um, each of the team members picked somebody that we wanted to develop a special relationship with that would always be with us, that would have our backs, uh, that we could depend upon and I picked a 15 year old boy named Dale and we had always been together whenever we went out in the jungles uh, uh, operations. He was always there with me. Um, I was always with him in the camp. We just had a very close relationship and uh, somehow in the midst of all that chaos and the initial morning of the uh, all the incoming, he found me and he picked me up and he wanted to take me down to the medical bunker to get taken care of. And I said, no, we have to stay out here because uh, <coughs> we knew that as soon as the artillery stopped, that that's when the ground assault was going to take place. And by that time, we had already seen some guys in the wire. Uh, I didn't know how many at the time, but afterwards we found out that there was 10,000, uh, there was three regiments of North Vietnamese, ten, about 10,000 troops that were trying to overrun the camp. So I told Dale, who was my bodyguard, that we needed to stay out here and fight. And uh, I was shot a couple more times. Um, Dale got shot in the leg. Um, but he continued to carry me. All the things that they said I did um, as far as taking care of uh, the wounded, I couldn't have done if Dale hadn't have uh, carried me. And then uh, we heard another rocket coming in and Dale threw himself on top of me to protect me. And he was killed um, by the blast. And after that, another one of my medics, mountain yard medics came by and um, picked me up. And then they, they carried me and we continued to treat those that were wounded. We continued to distribute ammunition, continued to fight because by that time, 
they were in the wire and there was um, a lot of close combat going on. And then eventually I, I collapsed, uh, collapsed a couple times, uh, but finally it was just one more, t one final time and I, uh, they then said, okay, I need to be medevaced. And so I was just lying in a bomb crater waiting for a chopper to come in to medevac me. People have asked me, did, did I feel fear at any time? And some, some, some guys would say, if somebody says that they don't ever feel fear in a battle situation, they're either crazy or they're lying. But I honestly can say that uh, at no time, looking back on it, do I remember being afraid. As a matter of fact, there was a point, one point when I thought I was going to die. And uh, I remember saying to Dale, you know, get me out of here because I was down in a bunker. I said, if I'm going to die, I'm going to die in battle. You know, there are very few things in life that you can really make, uh, you know, that you have total control of. Um, you're not going to, you don't really have much control about when you're going to die. But you can choose where, you know, and if maybe it was, maybe it was the warrior ethos that had been instilled in me by special forces. Um, maybe it was the love that I had for these people. Maybe it was the love that I was feeling as Dale was carrying me. I didn't feel fear about dying. I just knew that if I was going to die, I was going to die in battle. And what kept me going was my, the love for these people, the love that I shared with Dale, plus also uh, one of the things that the military taught us is training. And there's certain things that you do over and over and over again so that in the midst of a chaos, when things happen, like an ambush, when chaos sets in, if you don't know what to do, that's when you feel fearful. But if you know what to do, because you've been trained to do it and you have that muscle memory, when the chaos happens and those crises happen, the training will kick in and all of a sudden you'll just do things by, um, because of repetitive muscle memory. And in, in some way it's hard to explain, but there's, there's really, I didn't feel any emotion attached to the training that had kicked in. This is what I did. Okay, we have a war. We have people being killed. We have people trying to kill me. What do I do? And I t talked about that, you know, I fight that battle. The battle that I fought wasn't out here. The battle that I fought was in my own heart and in my own mind. And that's where the training took place. My heart and my mind was trained on what to do. I love these people. I care for these people. They're depending upon me for, for help. This is, I fight that battle here and here and say, okay, this is what I got to do. Um, I don't remember fear being that, being a part of that decision at all. If there was any emotion, it was the emotion of love. No fear. So what kept me going was training um, and the love that I felt from these people and the love that I had for these people. I was discharged and then moved back. I was discharged and then three days later I was in cl classes up in Western New York, back at the college where I had gone and quit the first time. But now that was 1971, where I had been I had before, 1965. And from 65 to 71, it had changed dramatically. It was much more anti-war. It was very, um, a very hostile place for somebody to be. I didn't have much. Didn't have much when I got in the military, so I used to have to wear my military uh, fatigue jackets and things like that. I lived in a van. I had a uh, 65 Volkswagen van that I was living in. On, and I would park in the parking lot and go over to the PE building in the morning, take a shower, and then attend classes. But I spent most of my time in the van because, like I said, it was. If somebody saw you on campus and you were wearing an army uniform, they immediately would just start yelling things at you or coming up behind you and taunting you. If you were in the library, 
Um, they'd walk by and knock your books off the table, uh, bump into you, try to knock you down. And then some mornings I would uh, wake up and find groups of students outside the van taunting me and knocking on the van, waking me up, uh, saying, come on outside, we want to hear what it's like to kill babies. Tell us what it's like to kill a baby. And uh, things like that. And that was, uh, it was a real tough time for me to, to, um, to have to try to find ways to deal with all the things that I was feeling from Vietnam. Um, and then to hear those kinds of things being thrown at you too, uh, it was just not a, the chemistry wasn't right. And then finally I got spit on one day and I said, that's it, I'm out of here. So I got in my van and I took off for New England. So I, I didn't really know where I was going, I just needed, knew I needed to take off. The safest place for me to go is to just leave, keep myself away from people. So that's when I went into the woods of New Hampshire. I found a place called Dome Rock and some caves and outgrowths that were there. And I said, um, yeah, this is where I want to stay. And so I would sit there and write, play my guitar, uh, read. And then I would drive in to Lancaster to attend classes. Uh, and after the classes, I'd take off again and uh, head off into the woods. That was my existence for two years. And that's where I was when I uh, found out that I was being awarded the Medal of Honor. Well, it was really strange because I, d I rented a post office box in Lancaster. And uh, um, I went in there one day and there was a note there that said, be down at the local uh, diner at 6 o'clock because there's going to be a phone call. And I thought that was kind of strange. And uh, so I went down there, and at 6 o'clock the phone rang, and they said, is there a Gary Biker here? I said, yes, I'm here. And he goes, phone call for you. So I went over to the phone, and he said, um, is this Gary Biker? And I said, yes. And he said, are you the Gary Biker that was with the 5th Special Forces in Vietnam? I said, yes, that's me. And he said, well, I've, uh, it's my honor to tell you that you won the medal of, you've been awarded the Medal of Honor. And I just went, oh, I mean, because I had been hiding in the, uh, in the jungle, trying to f in the woods, trying to forget everything uh, that hurt about that war. And I had just kind of found a peace where I was feeling good again, uh, being in the woods, away from people, away from um, the hurt, working on trying to forget, because my thought was that if I could forget, I'd get better if I could just forget all about that hurt, forget all about the, the guilt, that why am I alive and Deo is not, or all, this, all the others that were killed and uh, I'm still alive. The tremendous guilt that I felt and the anger that I felt. And I, I thought that if I could just forget all of that, that all those feelings would go away. You know? um, and now they're gonna give me a medal for all that. So I went back into the woods, and I just said, oh, I don't understand this. Um, I'd gone into the, when I'd gone into the cave and into the woods, I took with me uh, a, a saying that we had in Special Forces that said that I saw in a team house, it was a quote, and I used that as, as a like a sentence stub or something that I could that could help me start to think about what I was doing in that cave. And it said, to really live, you must almost die. To those that fight for it, life has a meaning that protected will never know. And so I had almost died. I had fought for my life. I fought for my life in Vietnam. I fought for my life in that hospital bed. I was fighting for my life on that college campus. I was fighting for my life in, that, in those woods. I didn't want to just survive, I wanted to live. And so I wanted to continue that fight because I wanted to know what life was all about. And so I was hoping that in the process of staying out there and through prayer and all these other things that I might be able to find out a little bit about what life meant. And 
it helped me put some order to the chaos that had just been uh, part of my life for those years in Vietnam. And now I was getting a Medal of Honor that was going to add to that chaos. And I thought, I can't deal with this. I don't, I don't know. Uh, I almost didn't want to go down there. But one of the things I did is I, I was looking through the book of Psalms and I came across a psalm that said, man that is in honor and understands not is like a beast that perishes. And so I said, well, maybe I, uh, I'm going to be getting an honor. I know I don't deserve it. I don't know why I'm getting it. But maybe God has something that he wants me to understand about life and about honor. And maybe that's why I'm in this cave. Maybe that's why I'm in these woods. I need to, I need to learn about some of these things. So I decided to go down. Um, I went down to Washington. Uh, they sent an officer up to escort me down to Washington, and they had a picture of when he first saw me. My hair's down to here, and he's got this really look of shock on his face because um, he, ex he was expecting to see a Green Beret kind of guy, and I'm, I'm looking like Jeremiah Johnson or something out of, the, out of the woods. But they took me down to Washington, uh, told me that they wouldn't make me cut my hair, but if I didn't cut my hair, I couldn't wear my uniform and receive my medal in my uniform. And I said, cut my hair, it's not that big a deal to me. So I was at the ceremony with President Nixon. There were nine of us that were there. Uh, after the ceremony, a lot of the guys went out because we were supposed to have like days, of, you know, two or three days of celebration there. My mother came down and my brother and my aunt uh, they were looking forward to some celebrations and stuff, tours around Washington. But I just stayed in a motel room or a hotel room. Uh, I didn't feel like celebrating. I was still trying to deal with everything that now had been brought up, all these feelings of, of guilt and anger and everything. And I, uh, I told them the next day, I said, um, I want to go home. And so they sent me home. I went back into the went back into the woods, I put the metal in my duffel bag, and I never took it out again for seven years. Um, mainly because I didn't feel worthy of it. Uh, so how did I feel after being awarded it? Um, definitely unworthy. Uh, angry, guilty, and it took me about seven years before I could reconcile the fact um, that I was being a, a presented with the Medal of Honor and how to wear it and wear it with the right attitude. And eventually that's what brought me out of the cave.